Thank you, Mohammed. Um, I think you, you bring us to an interesting juncture in our program. Um, we are running late. I'll still invite a few reflections uh, from us, the audience, but just to capture what Mohammed uh, raised, and I think that essentially revolves around the question of the extent to which we involve the ordinary persons, the community, civil society, non-state actors. Um, given that it, Richard's paper looked at the technocratic capacity to deliver on the mandate, and Mohammed Halfani questioned that lens as being narrow um, and therefore unable to actually accommodate the other capacities that exist, perhaps they are latent to the extent that they are not used, but it's a potential that could ultimately be used. Um, therefore, it will, raise, it will take us back to the question that uh, Mohammed, first Mohammed Halfani discussed, which was, given that there are changes happening in other countries, what is the nature of the, the, the capacity that is delivering this change in other countries? Of course, I mean, those countries and those cities were not in your study, so you cannot speak to that. But it is raising the question of that, is there opportunity, is there space for non-state actors to actually get involved in the delivery of services in a realistic fashion so that the transformation we are looking for occurs. That, I think, is what sums up the linkages between all the presentations so far, both the presentation and the reactions to the presentation. Um, uh, we are running short of time, but we'll do this. I'll take five, five. And so I'll, like, uh, we were guided by uh, Jean-Pierre this morning when I point to this direction, if you want to say anything, let me see your hand go up fast. So in the first uh, column, I'm going to look as the first column. Is there any reflection, any reaction? No. Second uh, column, which is this all the way to the back. Okay, I recognize you. The third column, is there any reaction? Okay, and then this last one here. Here, is there anybody who wants to react? Okay, so, um, okay, I saw a hand there. I saw a hand there. Yeah, you'll come back to react as well, yeah. So, um, let's hear you. Please introduce yourself and then straight Thank to the point. Much. Thank you very much. I'm Benny Sna. I work for Amnesty International Ghana. I'm Benisna. I work for Amnesty International Ghana. My concern has to do with um, having in mind uh, in terms of uh, land grabbing and also um, uh, developing our cities. Do we think of maybe having some guidelines because at some point people would have to be moved and um, maybe we put up some structures are we thinking of national guidelines in our various uh, countries as this sometimes brings about conflict uh, amount between us and then the people in the communities? Thank you. Yeah, that was a hand here. Hello, um, Oriol Barba from Indian Cities Network. We're in the future. Uh, is this is working? Yeah. My question is uh, for Richard on the first presentation. It's not working very well. Microphone. Okay. Yeah, my my. Qu yeah, uh, yeah. My question is for Richard later. One of the last slides we saw the comparison on the wages on the local um, public sector local companies, NGOs. Mm, in the case of Mediterranean countries, when we see international organizations working uh, in these countries, quite often the local consultants they work with, they used to work for the public sector before, and then they started engaging in partnerships with these in, uh, organizations, and then they ended up being um, consultants and leaving the public sector. So my question is, if you think that this is something that we can generalize in other countries and if international organizations, we should somehow 
make self-criticism for decapitalizing the public sector in, in some cases. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, I'll take you. You'll be the last person, and then there's a hand here. There's a hand here, and then we'll, I'll ask Richard to... Muito, muito obrigado. Bom, eu gostei de ter escutado a questão de responsabilização e envolvimento da comunidade na solução dos problemas. Porque, de facto, temos que investir mais nos conceitos da cidadania, em que todos devem compreender que viver em cidades tem custos. E, neste caso, passa necessariamente é, sobre os direitos e os deveres. E parte das soluções, de facto, passa necessariamente o movimento das comunidades. E nós, a nossa delegação, fico satisfeito de termos estado aqui também com a sociedade civil. Espero estarmos engajados para que as nossas comunidades compreendam que, de facto, precisam contribuir maior e melhor em termos de solução dos nossos problemas. De maneiras que não é só da responsabilidade do governo, mas também de todo cidadão, para que nós possamos encontrar soluções que possam nos tirar desta situação em que estávamos a, a passar de uma situação de paternalismo, por causa da nossa história, da saída do colonialismo, mas também de uma situação em que todos nós temos as responsabilidades para a solução dos nossos problemas. Muito obrigado. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you are also reiterating the role of civil society, um, but you are also asking for empowerment in terms of citizenship. And once the communities understand the issues, then they can also effectively partner with local, local governments or the state to deliver their services, as I, I, I understood you to be saying. So Richard, let me invite you now to first respond to a few of the issues that have been raised, whether you are using the right analytical approach to address this issue of service delivery, and then also whether it is, I mean, we can find space, uh, looking at how other countries are transforming, whether there is space for non-state actors to get in, involved, that would then reduce the burden on the local authorities to deliver the service. All right. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, yeah, basically, I would just quickly say that, uh, um, yes, our, our study on governance systems actually did look primarily at the formal systems of government. Um, I think already we were fairly stretched across a whole very wide range of sectors, as I mentioned earlier. We wanted to look at the administrative structures, the policies, the fiscal frameworks, the planning systems, the uh, service delivery mechanisms. So we had to draw the line somewhere, and obviously it would have been extremely nice to go further and extend that analysis into looking at uh, other areas, perhaps broader areas looking at the interactions with uh, non-state actors, particularly communities. But that wasn't um, essentially the brief that we had defined. So uh, I, I think that what I would say about the, the technocratic angle is that I still feel um, it's a relatively important one, partly because the enormous resources are put into this. Um, the state has a very major role still in working as a, um, a leader and a partner to some extent. And I think also that what we discovered in doing the analysis, we discovered quite a few problems, but we discovered a lot of opportunities. And the opportunities are all there embedded in the, in fact, they were in the slides. I think it said challenges and opportunities. And I think in every challenge, we see an opportunity because things are changing. I was not trying to give the impression, I guess, that uh, things are static at all. Uh, for example, in Ghana, we mentioned that the very strong sort of foundations have been laid in uh, administrative decentralization, but there are still problems. And I think if you don't recognize the problems, you can't actually start to come up with solutions. So we don't want to gloss over those. And I think each problem uh, had an opportunity. For example, if you look at the way private sector has come in to, uh, as a partner in development in quite a lot of the cities we visited, we found quite a vibrant private sector uh, participating in service delivery. 
but that could be so much better if the concession agreements and arrangements had been structured in a slightly different way and the state had recognized that it needs to part fund perhaps what are viability gaps in service provision. So I think the point is that there are many opportunities, even in own source revenues. I mentioned that uh, yeah, revenues are poor, property tax is not perhaps where it should be. That's a fact, I think. But uh, there are interesting innovations, which I didn't have time to go into, in relation to uh, GIS systems now that cities are just beginning to use to try and bring properties that have been left intentionally or unintentionally out of the tax net and to bring them into the tax net. So there's a lot of vibrancy, there's a lot of change going on. You have to recognize the problems to make sure the change is positive. On the issue of staffing um, and the question about whether uh, if you come in, um, for example, as an NGO or others, and you are you distorting the market in terms of pay? Um, I would say, you know, you're, you're probably not. Um, what I feel strongly is that cities have been suppressed in a number of ways. They've been suppressed in terms of the, uh, the types and forms of recruitment they've been allowed to make, the kind of human resources they've been able to bring on board, and their ability to pay those people. And there's a reality, you have to pay them. Uh, and the problem is the more we, um, we don't recognize or we allow cities to perhaps remain in that trap, uh, the, we create new incentives for perverse behavior and for vested interest. And what we kept seeing was that when things don't work well, when rent seeking happens, when local government officers take money for doing things that they should not take money for, those are there because they're supplementing salaries. One set of local government officers here in Ghana told me, um, actually we have to, uh, we don't have enough budget to, uh, to buy the stationery. Uh, nor to drive out to visit, to make field visits. So we asked them, well, how do you supplement that? And they, and, and they didn't really want to answer, but after a while, it became quite clear that they said, no, no, we have ways and means of covering that. Um, so, you know, the, the point is, we need to make sure the incentives are right um, in order that cities can actually uh, perform the mandated functions that they are there to perform. And yes, communities are a very important asset, um, but communities are partners in development. I don't think they should be made responsible for all of these things. That's the point I think we were trying to make. Thank you, Richard. Um, it would appear we ended abruptly. It's only because we're trying to save time. But the discussion is not ending here. We'll take the discussion into our break from here. and. Uh, through the evening to tomorrow as well, and throughout the entire uh, sessions until Friday when we leave. And I guess that even after we leave, we will also continue the discussion.